Chapter 15 I will ride for the desert immediately, Herbosa said her jaw, showing little of the worry that she felt. She remained steady. Link knew that she had to be. For Zelda. Yes, ride well, Herbosa. Zelda's face betrayed her worry and fear. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. They weren't ready. They all knew it. Rivali had been the first to depart. He reported Calamity Ganon's return, providing them with what little details he could, and then immediately flew for Rito Village. Daruk had been right behind him, placing a hand on both Link and Zelda's shoulders. He tried to say something comforting, anything to assure them. Ultimately, he told them that he would be there right beside them, before dropping to the ground and rolling down the path towards Death Mountain. Urbosa hugged Zelda, kissing the top of her head. Be strong, little bird. She released her and mounted her stallion. Keep her safe, Link. She turned her horse, galloping west on the one hour road towards Kokoriko Village. She had the longest distance to travel, and would be the last one to join the fight against Ganon. It would take days for her to reach the desert, even if she swapped horses along the way. Then only Mifa remained. She would travel through the Laneri River, using a series of over- and underground waterways to reach the Zora River. Though the last to leave, she would reach her divine beast first. She looked at Zelda, her hands clasped. I know this seems hopeless. Mipha stepped forward and took Zelda's hands in her own. But we will find a way through this. I believe in you both. Thank you. Zelda said, her voice quiet. Princess. At this, Zelda looked up at Mipha, meeting her eyes. This is not the end. Zelda nodded silently, giving her a tight smile. Mipha squeezed Zelda's hand tightly before releasing them and turning to Link. For a long time, she merely met Link's eyes, her eyes darting between each of Link's. She opened her mouth, but then shut it. For his part, he didn't know what to say to the woman that had been one of his closest friends. He'd known her for such a long time, yet at that moment, it felt as though it hadn't been nearly long enough. What would happen to them? Finally, she cleared her throat and moved forward, embracing Link. He returned her embrace, pulling her against him. Though he was not much taller than she was, she seemed small in his arms. Too small. Be safe, Link, she said. I will be at the castle as soon as I can. Keep the princess safe, but... Mipha hesitated, pulling back enough for her to look up and meet Link's eyes again. I will not be able to heal you while I am piloting Ruta. Do not take any unnecessary risks. Please. I'll try. His voice was a whisper. He pulled back from her, and she allowed him, though reluctant... Be careful. I do not think I am the one in most danger. Again, she looked as though there was something else she wanted to say, but she glanced at Zelda and sighed. Her gaze fell back on Link. Be strong, my friend. Mifa reached up, gently touching his cheek with her palm. Her touch was cool, as always, and he appreciated the gesture. She stepped back, looking to each one of them one more time before turning. She leaped into the air, spreading her arms and dove into the Laneru River. Mipha. Link's knees nearly buckled under the combined weight of the memory that flashed through his mind and the sight of her standing there, in the entrance to the Divine Beast, Varuta. Mipha remained silent, allowing him to compose himself, her expression still as warm as before. 
still as warm as the last time he'd seen her, because he knew deep down that the memory he had just witnessed had been their final goodbye. She looked just like she had 100 years in the past. Small and petite, she was shorter than Link, unlike most of the other Zora he had met. She had the same red coloring along most of her body that Sidon had, with the exception of her face and the front of her torso. The fish-like snout just above her golden eyes and red lips was less pronounced than her brother's, and lacked the wing-like protuberances. Her fins curved slightly, framing her face. Silver jewelry adorned her head, throat, and neckline, ornamented in multiple tear-shaped sapphires. A blue sash crafted with the same color and material as Link's champion's tunic stretched from her left shoulder to right hip. Link steadied himself, stepping forward slowly, taking in her appearance. She looked just the same as before, except... His heart sank. Mipha, like King Roam, glowed with a faint ethereal green light. She was not alive, but was instead a spirit. Yes, Mipha said, reading his expression. She met his eyes, her smile growing somber. Ganon's trap was cleverer than any of us could have expected, wasn't it? We all had such hopes. Everything came crashing down on him in that moment. The destruction of Hyrule, his lack of memories, the small remnant of survivors, her death, and the loss that the Zora people suffered for it. His failure, his shame. I'm sorry. This is all my fault. If I'd been stronger, if I'd been more prepared. Her eyes widened, and she shook her head, cutting him off with a single word. Link. He stopped talking, pressing his mouth closed. Link, you cannot blame yourself for this. She took a hesitant step forward, reaching out and placing an ethereal hand on his arm. He could feel her touch, but only faintly. None of us were prepared for the Lynx Cannon took to achieve its victory. We all fought the best we could. We thought the Divine Beast would save us. Yet it turned them and every other tool at our disposal against us. As skilled as you were, you could not fight it and an army of guardians. Link looked down. He wished he could take comfort in her words. Perhaps he could if he truly remembered more than just a few select memories of her. Bitterness at this state welled up within him, and he clenched his left hand into a tight fist. I can't remember. I can't remember what happened when I fought it, the Guardians, Princess Zelda, anything. Strangely, it hurt more to admit this to Mipha than it had to anyone else. You do not remember? The Shrine of Resurrection... It took my memories, he said. I've remembered some since then. I remember walking up Ploymus Mountain with you and... The end. He remembered their last moments together. Oh, Link, that... That is awful. I'm so sorry. She said, her voice heavy with emotion. She moved forward, wrapping her arms around him. For a moment, she felt solid. He could feel the texture of her scaled arms and her cheek on his shoulder. Then it was gone. She pulled away, and to his shock, she appeared even fainter now than before. He could see through her now, as though that simple act had taken much out of her. But you are beginning to remember? She asked. He forced himself to meet her eyes. I've remembered a little. Quick flashes of events. Good. Mifa gave a small smile. I am sure they will. You were always good at accomplishing whatever you set to accomplish. I don't know if it's that easy. Things in life worth pursuing rarely are. He looked at her, seeing her expression. Sadness. Pity. You are wearing my armor, she said eyes growing wide with recognition. She seemed to fight with herself for a moment. It fits you well. Better than I would have hoped. It's perfect, and I'm honored, truly. Did... 
Did they tell you what the purpose of the armor was? Her voice had risen in pitch, and she broke eye contact, gazing down towards their feet. I... Yeah. Oh. Mifa? She quickly shook her head, her fins waving. No. It is all right, it is... A little silly of me, isn't it? Being embarrassed now? I've been dead for one hundred years, after all. I'm sorry, he said for the second time. I just don't... My memories... No, please, she said, finally meeting his eyes again. It is enough just to see you alive again. That you are here, wearing my armor. It means more to me than I ever could adequately express. Link searched her eyes. What could he say to her now? He still wasn't sure how he had felt for her 100 years ago, though he had begun to suspect their relationship had never progressed beyond a close kinship. They had certainly been close, but the more he remembered, the more he felt a connection to her that was akin to siblings rather than lovers. But he simply did not know. Thank you, he said after an extended pause. It wasn't enough but it was all he knew to say at the moment. For this and everything else you've done for me. Mephis slowly approached the edge of the platform, sitting down upon it and looking out at the lake. The rain stopped, she said. That is good. I imagine the water level was getting high enough to risk damaging one of our dams. He sat down beside her, expression growing concerned. She still seemed fainter than before. Sedan and I. She gasped and looked at him with widening eyes. That was Sedan? I... Yes, he said, fumbling. You didn't know? No? Her voice grew quiet. I haven't been able to leave Ruta since I... He's grown so much. Hesitantly, Link reached out a hand, trying to place it on her shoulder. But he found nothing there. His fingers passing right through. He quickly withdrew his hand. She glanced at him and then away again, gazing out towards the unseen Zora's domain. He was only a child when Cannon awoke, Mipha explained. I still remember training him how to swim up waterfalls. I told Princess Zelda that I had to make sure he was ready, in case something happened to me. Then I think you trained him well, Link said, thinking about how Sadon had shown his ability to swim up waterfalls the other day. He had made it look effortless. He's a powerful warrior, too. He and I killed the Lionel on Plymouth Mountain yesterday. She looked at him, confused. There was another one? Link nodded. And you went with him. That is good. Fitting. Silence fell between them for a time longer, before she abruptly asked about her father. He told her all that he could about King Dorothan's welcome, and his reluctance to let Sidon attack the Lionel, about finding old friends in Baz and the others, and about the vehemence shown to Link by several of the elders. Somewhere along the way, he began to talk about his experiences since waking, the confusion he felt and the shame. At one point he stopped himself, feeling selfish. After everything she had gone through, Mipha didn't deserve to hear all of Link's problems, but she encouraged him to continue looking at him with genuine concern. So he did. It was cathartic for Link, speaking of the trials he had faced so far, and the pressure he felt to continue. Before he even realized what he was saying, he even told her that he didn't know he was supposed to succeed at the tasks placed before him, that he was concerned that he would just fail again. When he finished, Mipha looked at him with a strange mix of sadness, and what he thought might have been pride. It is strange. Before, when you pulled the Master Sword and became the Princess Knight, you... Well, you stopped speaking to people. I think you may have opened up to her near the end. But I was unable to get you to speak to me about your struggles. It seemed to me that you were holding much back. Link looked at her, feeling both drained and strangely reinvigorated by the confessions he'd made. Then I was an idiot. Mipha smiled and shook her head. No. But you could be blind. 
Her expression turned apologetic, but she continued on. I do not know if you saw that we were all under the same kind of pressure that you were. It still sounds like I was an idiot, he said, smiling. Mifa met his smile. From time to time. Silence settled around them. Below, waves lapped at Ruta's legs, creating a soothing sound. A flock of birds flew overhead. The sun shone down on them, bright and unhindered by rain or clouds. Ruta shuddered slightly, and Link looked back towards the entrance. It was shadowy inside. He looked at Mifa, hesitant to break the comfortable silence between them. She looked content. Her legs, slightly translucent and crossed at the ankles, dangled in the water. When she would occasionally move them, they caused very slight ripples. Finally, he spoke. Mifa, what happened to you? How did you die? She sighed softly, nodding. She pushed herself up from her seated position, and Link followed suit. Her gaze fell upon the dark entrance. Ganon. It laid a trap for me and presumably the other champions. When I boarded the Divine Beasts, there was something awaiting me. I tried to fight it, but it was so strong. After it killed me, it... She burst her lips, frowning up at the Divine Beast. It went to the castle to wait. I believe that it could have attacked the towns, but I think Ganon wanted to send a message. Or perhaps he could not control its weapons for some reason. I am not sure. The Guardians attacked, Link said, closing his hand into a fist. It didn't need the Divine Beasts. Mifa's gaze moved from the doorway to Link. Yes. She paused, then took a step forward, standing in the entrance. She turns, so she still faced him. Link, I am trapped here. Ruta is trapped as well. The blight left here by Ganon taints this place, distorts it. It is a prison. Free the divine beast from Ganon's malice. This was what Impa said. Link hadn't been sure what she had meant, and in all likelihood she hadn't either. He grimaced, stepping closer to Mifa. He looked down and met her eyes. You're trapped here. Mifa nodded. I have not been able to leave Ruta for the past 100 years. It has been just me and... it. He saw something of the horror she'd experienced reflected on her face, and he felt his heart break. She hadn't deserved this. None of them had. Link attached his shield to his arm, and then drew his sword, eyes hardening. And destroying it will free you? And the Divine Beast? I believe so. Yes, Mifa paused. Link, I think that I can still help you with Ganon. Ruta and I have a connection. I can still feel her, ever so faintly. Perhaps if I am not being blocked, I may still be able to control her somehow. Ever since his awakening, Link had lamented the position he found himself in. His lost memories, his failures... His burden. He had regretted all of it. He had wanted out. But gazing upon Mifa in that moment, his resolve hardened. No more failures. He would shoulder this burden. He nodded and stepped past the ghostly form of Mifa, into the heart of the divine beast, Varuta. The moment Link stepped over the threshold, he knew immediately that something was very wrong. The air felt wrong. Heavy. Oily. It smelled sour and stung his nostrils. It made his body felt strange. Weak. Overextended. It was as if, in that moment, every ache, every pain, every sore muscle from his journeys were magnified and brought to the forefront of his mind. Somewhere in the shadowy recesses of his forgotten memories, he recognized this feeling. Ganon. A light sweat broke out on his forehead as he gazed around at the large open chamber. 
the inner mechanics of the Divine Beast were shockingly complex and unfamiliar. Massive interlocking gears were positioned along the walls, though none were moving now. There were several pools of water inlaid into the ground, with a network of metal pipes of various sizes that rose out of them, all angling towards the front of the Divine Beast. In two of the largest pools there was a pair of massive water wheels, which had also stopped moving, though water still dripped lazily off the paddles. Walkways with metal grates crisscrossed all around the massive chamber. The ground was mostly stone, but large swaths of it was covered a strange deep purple and black substance that bubbled and oozed. The sight of it unsettled him. Repulsed him. The hair all along his arms stood on end, and a shiver ran up his neck. He wanted nothing to do with it. Mipha stepped up next to him, her eyes upon the substance, expression grim. Try not to touch it. It is somehow related to the thing that took over Ruta. Link nodded. Where is it? he asked, looking for any sign of the creature that had killed her. The massive chamber was eerily silent, save for the occasional drips of water from the water wheel's paddles, which landed in the pools of water below. He couldn't even hear the lapping of waves that he'd heard so well outside a moment ago. Link, are you sure about this? Mipha's voice betrayed her anxiety, and his gaze fell to her. It is strong. It killed me. If something happens to you, I... It will be all right, he said, his voice soft but firm. She met his eyes, and he saw the fear there. Not fear for herself, or likely even Hyrule, but his well-being. He wished that he could reassure her more. If he was honest with himself, he didn't feel all that confident either. But he had to try. For Mipha, who lost her life to this creature. For Zidane, who lost a sister. For the Zora race, who lost a champion. For himself, who lost a dear friend. It will be this way, she finally said, turning and walking towards the rear of the Divine Beast. As she led him through, the air only seemed to grow heavier, and the sour smell worse. It was the smell of rot and decay and something else that caused his nostrils to burn. It made his stomach twist with nausea, but he pushed it down. He followed her through a series of hallways and smaller rooms, until finally, they reached a final hall that led down a small incline before opening into another room. From his vantage, Link could see nothing moving in the room. Mipha met his eyes one last time, and he nodded. She only hesitated another moment before beginning down towards the room. The room was large and cavernous, with rounded walls covered in Sheikah designs. The far wall had several floor-to-ceiling windows that overlooked the lake outside. Directly in front of the windows sat some kind of device. It looked like a closed flower with petals that had not yet bloomed. It shone with an orange light that pulsed slightly. Before it was some kind of waist-high panel, with a flat surface that contained more glowing orange lights, but nothing else that Link could see. The floor was covered with a couple inches of cool water. Whatever had killed Mipha was nowhere to be seen. Mipha? He asked, voice a whisper. It's here. She pointed at the device in the center of the room. At first he saw nothing new, but then he began to see some kind of red-purple haze rising from around the orange device. It began to circle lazily around it, growing thicker and more obscuring as it did so. It took only a few moments before he recognized it as the same strange mist that had surrounded the castle when Ganon was about to emerge. The mist began to gather in front of the device, growing thicker and obscuring. As it did so, it looked more and more like the strange oozing substance that they had seen on the floor. In fact, after another few moments, he was certain that they were the same. It no longer looked like mist at all, having taken on a much more solid form in the shape of a floating sphere. Be careful, Link. Mipha said. The sphere of purple ooze began to take on a different shape. It grew long and narrow, before several appendages began to extend from places along its length. 
a pair of stunted legs grew, floating above the ground and terminating in round stumps. A pair of arms grew, one thin and the other easily twice as long and thick. The head began to take shape as well, narrow and pointed. Red hair easily as thick as the lionel's mane sprouted from the back of its head, falling all the way down its back. It towered over him, taller than he was, even without its ability to float in the air. It was not done yet, however. As he watched, armor that seemed to be made of the same stone that was used in Varuda's construction appeared. Its stunted legs, waist, and chest were all partially covered in the armor. The long arm was fully encased in the same armor, from the elbow down. Its head was, likewise, encased in armor, though this extended out to either side of its head in a pair of flattened horns. Link looked in horror as a round blue eye appeared in the center of its head. A guardian's eye. He saw a flash of memory, a blue eye pulsing as it looked at him, but he pushed it away as quickly as it appeared. He did not have time for distractions right now. That blue eye focused on him, and something about the creature's posture changed. It leaned forward in a menacing way, and its longer arm extended. There was a flash of light, as a glowing blue spear extended from the hand there, easily three times as long as Link was tall. It shone just like the guardian sword at his waist did. The creature suddenly reared back, throwing both of its arms out and its head back, and released a horrible shriek that made the walls tremble. Link's instincts screamed at him to move, and he did, leaping to the side. A moment later, the creature thrust its spear forward. The incredibly long spear crossed the distance between them in an eye blink stabbing thin air where he had just been. He broke into a sprint, his feet kicking up a spray of water. The massive spear put him at a huge disadvantage at range. He hoped it would be too unwieldy to use against an opponent up close. Unfortunately for him, he misjudged just how high off the ground the creature floated. It hovered in the air several feet off the ground, meaning that Link could not attack with the kind of coordination and ferocity that he would have preferred. He swung anyway, his sword hitting the armor of the creature's legs. The sword only bounced off harmless. The creature's counter, however, was not. It swung its free hand, shorter than the other, and ending in vicious-looking claws, and caught him in the side. He felt a sudden stabbing pain in his side as his feet lifted off the ground. He flew back and hit the water in a heap, rolling to keep his momentum and prevent being run through with the spear. He heard Mepha's voice, crying his name from a distance, but he ignored it. He jumped to his feet, taking several more steps back to try to keep out of range of the spear. Where he had been lying, he saw a cloud of red in the water. His blood. Grimacing, he reached down to his side where the creature had struck him. His hand came away red. Its claws had pierced his door armor like it was nothing. The wound didn't hurt. Adrenaline kept most of the pain at bay for the time being, and he tried to force any concerns over the wound anyway. There would be plenty of time to assess the damage done to his body once the fight was over. Or he would be dead, and individual injuries would no longer matter anyway. The creature lunged at Link again, and he, too disoriented to dodge, thrusted his shield out. The spear glanced off the shield emblazoned with the Sheikah eye, and mercifully, the shield held. The spear thrust past him, crackling with the strange guardian energy, and he stepped back, weighing his options. The creature floated off the ground, making it difficult to strike with any damage, and its reach would spell Link's doom if he wasn't careful. To make matters worse, his sword was ineffective against anything he could reach. He had more than one sword, however. Thrusting his silver sword back in its scabbard, Link pulled the Guardian Sword from its place on his waist, igniting it with a flash of blue light. The creature made a hissing sound and thrust its spear once again at Link. He sidestepped it and broke into another run. The creature was ready for him this time, raising its shorter right hand, claws extended, ready to sweep him away like before. As it did, however, Link thrust his Guardian Sword out, impaling the creature's palm on the beam of blue energy. 
The creature shrieked, backing away. Purple mist burst from the hand like spraying blood, and the creature raised the hand well out of Link's range. He could hurt it. That was good. The next question was whether or not he could actually kill it. It swung the spear at him in a wide arc, and he threw himself forward onto his belly in the water. He heard the hum of the spear as it passed overhead, and leapt back to his feet, running towards the creature again. A wall of ice suddenly burst out of the water in front of him, and Link stumbled, hitting the ice with his shoulder. Of course it had the ability to use Cryonis. Link! Watch out! Mifa's voice, shrill and terrified. The ice wall shattered as the creature thrust its spear through it. He was saved by blind luck. As the spear pierced the ice, it struck his shield, knocking him onto his back in the water. The spear continued on overhead, before it twisted onto its side. The impossibly sharp edge pointed down towards Link. Eyes widening, he rolled to his side just as the spear's edge crashed down the ground, where it had been like a butcher's knife. He pushed himself up, kicking up another splash of water as he attempted to round the ice wall again, trying to get within the creature's guard. The ice extended to follow him, forming a barrier that would cost Link precious seconds to try to scale. Fine, he thought, scowling and turned, running back enough to give himself enough space. He placed the guardian sword back in its spot at his waist and grabbed his bow. Spinning around, he took aim with a shock arrow and launched it at the creature. The arrow struck home, dead center of its chest. It shrieked, throwing its arms wide as electricity coursed through its body. The ice wall shattered, and its spear deactivated. He broke into a sprint, slinging the bow over his shoulder and pulling the guardian sword back out. He activated it, and yelled a battle cry as he leaped off a chunk of remaining ice, slashing the sword vertically down through the creature's chest. The creature shrieked again, backing away quickly as purple mist sprayed out of its chest. Link hit the ground badly, and his ankle buckled underneath him, sending him crashing to the water. He was pretty sure it was sprained, if not worse. In front of him, the creature, chest still leaking dark mist, thrust its larger arm out again, and its spear reappeared with a flash of blue light. Groaning, he pushed himself to his feet, and he knew immediately that he was in trouble. His ankle sent stabs of pain up his leg, and would not hold his weight. Worse, he could feel his other wounds now. It felt as though his bleeding side was on fire. The creature, eye pulsing with fierce intensity, stabbed out with the spear, forcing Link to stumble to the side. His ankle gave out, and he crashed back to the water. He again forced himself to his feet, gritting his teeth. The creature had noticed his incapacitation, and it approached slowly. He heard a noise originate from it. It sounded like a series of short grunts. It dawned on him a moment later that the creature was chuckling. It was laughing at him. It had him, and it wanted to gloat in its apparent victory. It thrust its spear again, and he tried to dodge out of the way. This time, he was too slow. It cut across his sword arm, leaving a deep gash and causing him to drop his sword, which clattered to the pool of water and deactivated with a hiss. Drops of red slipped from his limp fingers. The creature stopped, towering over him and drew its arm back again, preparing to thrust. Hurriedly, Link pulled the bow from around his body, hoping to get off another shock arrow, but his hand wasn't working right. He was having trouble gripping an arrow shaft. He stumbled back, and then his ankle gave out. He cried out and fell into the water, the bow landed in the water next to him. Ganon's creation thrust the mastiff guardian spear down into Link's chest. No! Mipha's shrill cry. He could barely hear it. He'd felt the sudden blinding pain, but then it was followed by cold numbness that quickly spread throughout his body. His arms buckled, and he collapsed onto the water, face just barely over its surface. The creature was there, standing over him, having dismissed its spear. It chortled in that low, inhuman way, knowing that it had won. It killed Link, as it had killed Mipha so many years ago. 
but she was there too, suddenly vibrant and visible, barely translucent at all, though she still had the green halo of light that outlined her body. Link smiled painfully at her. He could no longer move his limbs. He was barely even aware of his own body anymore. He was already fading. I'm sorry, Mifa. Mifa knelt beside him, her face close to his. Her expression shifted from that of anguish to a fierce determination. She looked at her hands and then met his eyes. Her lips formed words that he could no longer hear. The darkness encroached on his vision. She placed her hands on his chest. They had begun to glow with a blue-white light. He knew that light. The sun had begun to set, leaving the partially cloudy sky a mix of blue, purple, and orange. The summer warmth remained, however. The breeze that Link felt, while sitting with Mipha atop Ruta's long trunk, felt pleasant as it blew through his hair. It was a peaceful end to an otherwise eventful day. Link glanced at his companion for the day. She had requested his presence at Zora's domain, and he on the rare occasion that he was free from his normal duties, obliged. It had been a while since he'd traveled on his own, and besides, he'd heard that there was a group of Lizalfos that had been attacking travelers along the Zora River. He had dealt with the Lizalfos easily enough, though he had sustained a trio of shallow cuts on his fright forearm, courtesy of one such Lizalfo that had managed to get past his shield. It was just his luck that on the one day he didn't wear his bracers, he fought an enemy that tried to pull his shield out of his hand. Shortly thereafter, he came across a Zora that had been sent to find him, who gave him a ride upriver, cutting his travel time by at least a full day. Mipha had been eager to see him, it would seem, which initially caused Link some concern. Was something wrong? But no. Outside of the Lizalvos, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Eventually, they found themselves together on Ruta's trunk. Mipha easily commanded the Divine Beast to lift them up into the air, high enough that they could see miles around them. Mount Laneru stood sentinel to the south, while in the far distance... Link could see Hyrule Castle, standing tall and proud. He wondered what Zelda was doing right now, probably working on some new issue with controlling the Guardians, or perhaps she was dressed in her white ceremonial robes, praying to the goddess once again. Now let me see that arm. Mifa's voice drew his attention back to her. He smiled somewhat sheepishly. How did you know? Mifa gave him a smile, and he pulled his sleeve back. She began to unwrap the dressing from his arm with deft hands. I always knew. The dressing's white outer layers gave way to pink, red, and then red-brown as she unwrapped it. When it was exposed to the cool breeze, his bare arm stung slightly. Mifa looked over it with a critical eye. The Lizalfos? she said, looking up at his face. He nodded in reply. She sighed softly, shaking her head. You know, I'm sure my father's soldiers could have handled the incursion. He had already sent out parties to try and find them. I found them first, Link said. She gave him a look, and unable to help himself, he smiled faintly. You went looking for them. She wrapped her small fingers around Link's bare elbow, holding his injured arm aloft, and her other hand hovered in the air just above his forearm. It began to glow with a blue-white light. They both sat in silence for a moment as Mipha prepared her healing magic. Finally, she spoke again, her tone softer now. I was thinking that this reminds me of the time we first met. How so? Link didn't remember their meeting very well. He had only been four years old at the time. He was fairly certain that she looked much as she did now, though. Well... You were such a reckless child, always getting yourself hurt at every turn. She met his eyes, smiling warmly. 
Not so different than you are now, I suppose. He snorted. I prefer the term courageous. Yes, you dreamed of being a courageous knight even then. Just like your father. She fell silent, looking away from him and towards the distant castle. She seemed to be considering something. I would heal you every time, she said, her voice softer. Just as I am doing right now. Link's arm felt as if it had been lowered into a pool of cool water. The pain from his wounds began to fade as the ripped skin began to knit itself back together. He watched, fascinated. Link looked up from his healing arm to meet Mifa's eyes. She looked right at him, barely even paying attention to her own healing magic. Isn't it funny how being a Hylian, you've grown up so much faster than I did. When I met you, you were just a child, but now we are both adults in similar stages of life. Her eyes never left his, and he felt frozen in place, unwilling to break that gaze. He'd never truly thought of it before, but it was true. Though he'd known Mifa almost his entire life, his relationship with her had subtly changed as he grew older. She had once been like an older sister to him, always watching over him when he played with Baz, Gaddison, and Ravan. As he'd grown older, however, he soon outpaced his old friends in responsibility and maturity. While he maintained a friendship with them, even to this day, he had at some point become a teacher and mentor to them. Meanwhile, he now looked to Mipha as a peer, and one of his closest friends. I was always willing to heal your wounds even back then. She finally broke the eye contact, looking back down at his arm demurely. He did the same, watching as the last of the cuts, now little more than scratches, faded completely. Some dry blood remained on his forearm, but the injuries that caused the blood had been healed without even a scar. She drew her healing hand back, though the hand holding his arm lingered for another few seconds before releasing him. She placed both of her hands back in her lap, her gaze growing distant again. He inspected his arm, amazed as always at her abilities, but looked back at her when she spoke next. So if this calamity Ganon does, in fact, return, what can we really do? Her eyes seemed to be focused on the distant castle. What do you mean? He wondered if she was thinking about Zelda's continued struggle to awaken her sealing powers. If someone else had questioned it, he might have grown offended. But he knew there was no judgment in Mipha's words or tone. We just don't seem to know much about what we will be up against. She shook her head, looking down at her hands. They were small, delicate, but he knew that she was as ready to fight as he was. She had a strong warrior spirit, though he wondered at times if she even knew it. But know this, Link, she said, clasping her hands together. She lifted her gaze, meaning his eyes again. No matter how difficult this battle might get, if you, if anyone should seek to do you harm, then I will heal you. He thought of all the times she had done just that, the battles they'd fought together, when he spent his adolescent summers in Zora's domain, or as an adult, such as the fight against the Lionel. No matter when, or how bad the wound. I hope you know. I do, Link said. She smiled faintly before continuing. That I will always protect you. Silence fell between them as Link sat, stunned. Protect. As a knight, it was his duty to protect. To protect the kingdom. To protect the princess. To protect Mipha. That she thought of herself having a duty to protect him was both surprising and touching. He felt his face grow warm. Mipha seemed to be considering something as she looked down at her hands. The silver bangles that she wore on her wrists had hard-shaped cutouts. Were those new? He thought that she had worn more ornamentation today than she often did. After a few more moments of silence, she seemed to come to a decision, looking back up at him. She placed her hand on the small bag that she had brought with her today. She hadn't told him what was in it. Once this whole thing is over, 
Maybe things can go back to how they used to be, when we were young, she said. There was a determination in her eyes as she met his. You know, perhaps we can spend some more time together. Link looked into her golden eyes, struck by how the setting sun caused the sapphires on her head and neck to sparkle. You will not take him, Mipha cried as she placed her shining hands to Link's chest, where the guardian spear had impaled him. Where the healing magic in the memory had felt like dipping his arm in a pool of cool water, this felt like a bucket of ice had been poured over his entire body. His back arched, and he gasped sharply, eyes opening wide. For a moment, every pain in his body seemed to flare with life, and then in the next breath, it was gone. Every pain, every wound. His back, chest, side, and arm, all knit closed. His internal organs became whole. His ankle righted itself, muscle and sinew growing strong again. He met her eyes, and she appeared as shocked as he was. He doubted that she had ever healed anyone like that before. Behind Mipha, the creature shrieked in fury, its spear reactivating in an outstretched hand. Link threw himself back onto his feet, his body renewed. When the next spear thrust came, he spun away and then used his foot to hook onto the bow and kick it up into the air. He caught it and pulled the shock arrow from his quiver, looking up at the furious creature. He knocked the arrow, his lips pulled back into a cold grin, and released it. It struck the creature directly in the eye. The creature roared in agony, shuddering as lightning arced over its face and body. Like a marionette with its strings cut, it collapsed to the ground, twitching from the electricity. Its spear deactivated. Link dropped his bow and grabbed up his fallen sword, reactivating its blue blade. He sprinted towards the creature, yelling his war cry and thrust the blade past the shock arrow into the prone monster's eye. The blade sunk all the way to its hilt. Ganon's creature reared back, screaming with a new terrible sound that reverberated off the walls and caused Link to stumble back leaving the sword lodged in its thigh. It rose back into the air and thrashed, throwing its head back. Its arms shook violently as they reached up to its face, clawing blindly for the source of its agony. The red-purple ooze that made up its body darkened and seemed to grow hard, brittle. An audible crack echoed off the chamber walls, and its larger arm broke off, falling to the ground with a splash. When it hit the ground, the entire arm armor and all, shattered into dark violet mist. The creature trembled violently, drawing its legs and remaining arm in. It curled around them, and then it too, shattered into mist. Link watched with awe as the mist spun around itself briefly, as if trying to reshape itself again, and then began to dissipate. After a few more seconds, it was gone, and he was left in an empty room. He watched the mist as it disappeared before finally exhaling a long breath. His shoulders slumped, and his racing heart began to slow. He turned and saw Mipha standing a few feet away. She looked up at him, and after a moment of stunned silence, she smiled. You did it. I... You healed me. The reality of the situation began to set in. He looked down at his armor, which bore the scars of his battle. It was ripped and torn in several places, revealing his unscarred flesh beneath. Mipha reached out, placing her translucent hand on the torn part of the armor she made him. The silvery scale still remained, though it hung only by a few threads. I did not even know that I still could. Thank you. Mipha laughed softly and shook her head. You saved me. You saved Ruta. And you protected me. Just like you promised you always would. Mipha looked at him in surprise. It took her a moment of indecision before she spoke. And I always will. She clasped her hands over her chest, meeting his eyes. Her hands began to glow with her healing light again. After a moment, she reached out and placed her hands against his chest. 
a feeling like that of cool water spread from the spot that she touched, flowing through him to the tips of his fingers and toes. He gasped softly at the sensation, which only lasted for a few seconds before fading, except for the palm of his hands. He lifted his hands, surprised to see the soft healing light emanating from them now. I've given you my healing power. Mipha's visage had grown noticeably more translucent. Her voice was softer as well. I do not believe I will be able to accompany you. My place will still be here, with Ruta. I don't understand, Link said, frowning. You said you were trapped. I thought that I was freeing you. The light faded from his palms and he lowered them to his sides. No, but how could you? She turned, waving her hand around the large room. I can feel her again. Think, when you destroyed that thing, I could... I can... This... All of a sudden, the divine beast trumpeted, causing the entire structure to tremble slightly. Mipha laughed, the joy apparent on her face, as she threw her head back, arms wide. She turned back to Link. I'm in control of her again. Somehow, even though I am just a spirit, my connection with her remains. It finally dawned on him what this meant, and his eyes widened. You can still use it against Ganon? Yes, she nodded emphatically. Now that I am in control of her, I can bring her full power to bear on that monster. And if I free the others, then we can attack him like we were supposed to 100 years ago. This was the true genius of Princess Zelda's plan. Impa had mentioned restoring the original functionality to the Divine Beasts, but it never really occurred to him what that would mean. Silence settled between them as they both considered the path in front of Link. So much had gone into freeing just one. It was daunting to think that Link would have to accomplish this all again three more times before even attempting to destroy Ganon. I believe in you, Link. Mifa reached out, placing her ghostly hand against his arm. He could just feel her touch and the scaled texture of her hand. You can do this. I hope you're right. I am. Her hand lingered on his arm for several more seconds before she pulled it away. Link gave her a grateful look before stepping over to where his guardian sword fell after the creature disintegrated. He found the deactivated hilt lying in the water and picked it up. He attempted to activate it, but it only sparked fitfully. He tried it a few more times before placing it back in his belt. Perhaps he would see if Pura could repair it. Link? He turned in Miva's voice. She was standing over by the device in the center of the room. She moved around behind it. Can you come here? I have something I need to do. When Link walked over to where Mifa stood, he saw a glint of silver in the water by her feet. His eyes widened. Your trident. Mifa's light-scaled trident lay in the shallow pool of water, abandoned after her untimely demise 100 years ago. Link bent down, wrapping his fingers around its haft, lifting it out of the water. It was pristine, without a spot of rust, despite its age and the condition that it had spent the last 100 years. It was made of the same silvery white metal that most Zora weaponry was made of, yet it seemed to shine brighter than anything else he had seen. Sapphires glistened at multiple places on the trident, including one very large oval in the center. It was an incredible piece of craftsmanship. I want you to give it to my brother, she said, looking at her old weapon with fondness. Link smiled, unable to imagine anyone worthier of inheriting her trident. I will. And tell him that. She hesitated, looking down. Tell him that I am proud of him. He has grown up so strong. Link nodded, his smile fading as he saw the sadness in her face. I'm sorry, Mifa. 
Mifa shook her head, lifting her chin. It is all right. We have all made sacrifices. It will be worth it when we finish canon once and for all. It will be. <laughs>